Well, good morning, City Light. As uh, as Chris said, my name is Andrew. I am on staff here as the college director, and uh, I'm excited to be here. I'm excited that you guys are here, and I think it's a, a privilege and a joy to go through God's Word this morning together. And so, I want to start though with a with with a question. Okay, so I want you guys to think through this a little bit with me. Have you ever had a time? in your life where you maybe have done something or believed something or said something that maybe was a little bit foolish or ignorant, maybe something that, uh, an idea that you believed in or something that you said that looking back you kind of regret, you kind of wish that, man, maybe if there was somebody a little bit older, a little bit wiser, a little bit more experienced, maybe they could have protected me from maybe saying something like that. Maybe they could have warned me about a situation where maybe they'd sit you down and say, hey, I've been there. I see what you're doing. I see what's going on. I, I want to protect you from, from what could come. I've experienced this. Have you ever had a moment like that? Have you ever had someone do that for you? Or maybe, like me, have you ever had that moment that you wish someone would have done that for you before you said that thing or believed that? I'll give you a couple examples uh, in my life. I, um, one was, I think I was about 19. I was a freshman in college, so naturally I thought I had the whole world figured out. And so I was talking to my sister and brother-in-law, and I was talking to them. I said, you know, I don't think there will ever be a time in my marriage where I'll need to fight with my wife. <laughs> so, you know, I, if I really loved my wife... I would just let her win the arguments, right? Like, I, I, it wouldn't be a big deal. Yeah. It's, for married couples, you know that's a little bit foolish and ignorant. I mean, I didn't know a real relationship in my sinful nature would combine to produce the arguments every once in a while. Or, or a couple years later, I was a senior in college, and I had just started dating my uh, now wife, Bailey. And so we were dating maybe two or three months. And there was a time where uh, I was in my dorm room. I knew she was coming over, so I hear a knock at the door. I go, I open the door, and Bailey had just, uh, which I didn't know about, she had just gotten a haircut. And, um, yeah, so she just gotten this haircut, and she honestly really doesn't do anything, like, too drastic to her hair ever. It's it's usually fairly similar, as as beautiful as ever. And uh, so I I open the door, and she had had gotten cut into bangs. And so I, uh, I open the door, I look at her, and she's, you know, cute as ever, standing there, smiling at me, just waiting for me to say, sweetheart, like, that's, that's adorable, I love this, and... I open the door, I, I look her right in the eye, and I go, huh. And, uh, and she, looks, she looks back at me, her face kind of goes down a little bit, and she's like, do you like it? And I promise you, I said, you know, I don't usually like bangs, no. And that was not a win. That was not a good one for me. But in that moment, I wished that I had somebody before maybe tell me, hey, if your girlfriend gets a haircut, Go ahead and, and not say that you don't like it. Like, that's going to that's gonna be better for you, right? Like, and we need these things, right? We all say stupid things at times. We all believe things that are just ignorant or naive, and we just don't know what's coming. We don't know the foolishness that we're buying into or the danger that could potentially come. Have you ever had any of these moments? You know, I think as we get into our text this morning... What Paul's doing here, we see an older saint, the Apostle Paul, and he's speaking into a younger church at Philippi. And he's speaking in and warning them about a danger that's coming. He said, there's going to be something that you could potentially believe in that you may fall victim to, and I want to protect you from this. He's going to give us a warning and say, this matters. Because you know, Some of the examples I gave or some of the things that maybe you think about in your life that you've done or said, they're not really life and death usually, except when I told Bailey that I didn't like her haircut. That was close to life and death. But other than that, I mean, most of the things we believe in or say, I mean, it's not life or death. But for Paul this morning, his warning to the Philippian church and his warning to our church is absolutely an issue of life and death. What Paul is going to warn us about is not just about saying something stupid that doesn't really matter. It's about eternal life and eternal death. This matters to us this morning, church. 
So if you have not done so yet, would you get out your Bible, get out your phone, whatever you need to do, go Philippians chapter 3. If you don't have a Bible, it's okay. We'll put the verses on the screen in a minute. But if you have a Bible, Philippians chapter 3. And I want to set the stage a little bit for us before we jump into the text. So what Paul's going to do here, the issue that he's speaking about is the idea of righteousness. Okay, He's talking about the idea of righteousness. Now, righteousness simply is just the level of good in our lives. The level of good in us, our holiness, our righteousness. That would, that's what he's going to speak about. But here's what the Bible teaches about our goodness, our righteousness. You see, if we go all the way back into Genesis 2, we see God create Adam and Eve, and he says that they are created very good, very righteous. And we see the life that they have is in complete, perfect standing with God. There's no separation. They are perfect with God. Next chapter, we see Genesis 3 and Adam and Eve sin. And instantly, when they sin against God, they now hide from God. And the consequence of that sin is that they are no longer very good and in right standing with God. Immediately, there is a separation between God and mankind. And Romans 5 says that as Adam sinned, then through him all have sinned. Every one of us in this room have sinned, and because of that, it has caused a separation between you and God. And this, this idea, is the paramount problem of all humankind. Our greatest problem that we have to come face to face with is that we are not perfect. And if the God of the Bible is who he says he is, he is perfect. He is fully righteous, fully good, fully holy. To be in God's ultimate presence then, to to experience eternal life forevermore, you and I then need to be righteous enough. We have to be as righteous as God. In other words, we need perfection. We need to be that good. We can't just be okay. We can't just be better than our friends or our neighbors. We, we have to be good. So the question then is, how do we do that? If we're not perfect, if we're not good, how do we get good? How do we become close to God if that's our biggest problem? All other questions pale in comparison to this question, how do I get to God? If I'm a sinner, if I'm not perfect, how do I get to a perfect and holy God? And in our text this morning, the older, wiser, more experienced Apostle Paul is going to sit us down, look us in the eye, and he's going to warn us of a dangerous path to take to get that righteousness, and he's going to plead with us for another path. He's going to show us two differing ways that we have that we can try to get to God. The two things that he's going to show us is a self-righteousness or an imputed righteousness. Self-righteousness or imputed righteousness. And if you don't know what those two things are, that's great. Those are the two points for today. So that's what we're going to see. Is Paul saying, I'm going to protect you from one and I'm going to give a plea for another. In the question, how do I become righteous or how do I get to God? So let's go Philippians chapter 3. I'm going to start in verse 2. So Paul is giving a warning. He says, look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus. Now I put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the tri- of people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. So here's what Paul's doing. The first attempted solution to our problem 
with right standing with God is this idea of self-righteousness. And Paul is going to try to warn and protect us from this idea of self-righteousness. We see this right away in verse 2. The way that he addresses this is he says, look out for or be careful of, be on guard for, watch out for the dogs, for the evildoers, for those who mutilate the flesh. And what Paul's doing in this section is he's trying to warn a, a younger church of a potential belief that they may fall victim to. As I read this this week, I thought, this is a belief that all of us in this room often fall victim to. You see, what was going on then is that Paul was going around from city to city, from region to region, planning these churches, preaching the gospel, but there was this group called the Judaizers that would come in after him. And what they would do is they would come in and they'd say, yes, like Jesus, that is, that's great, have faith in Jesus, but that's not quite enough. Like Jesus is good, but to become a true Christian, they said, you need to first become a true Jew. And the pinnacle of that is you need to be circumcised. Essentially what they're saying is, look, that's nice that you believe in Jesus, but that's still not enough. You have to add to it as well. And friends, this is the idea of self-righteousness. This, it's the belief that you can do enough good to get your way to God. That you can be a good enough person. That you can compile a big enough list of good things. That, that if you just worked on yourself a little bit harder... If you just worked on your disciplines a little bit more, if you just upped your church attendance a little bit more, that maybe then I could get to God. I mean, doesn't this sound all too familiar? Don't we have these thoughts that run through our head that, that I mean, I'm not doing very well right now, so, so what do I need to do to get close to God? See, like, this is a lie that Paul is warning us from believing. And you can tell how vehemently he hates this belief system with how he addresses the people in verse 2. He calls them dogs. He calls them evildoers, mutilators. And if you were in Philippi at this time, you know that this is a direct punch in the gut to these Judaizers. You see, the Jews were the people of God, and they considered all Gentiles, which simply means non-Jews, so everybody else, they said that they were not worthy of being God's people. They called them dogs, evildoers. They said they were not circumcised, which was the external sign of being a part of the people of God. So this is how they saw other people. But Paul comes in, and Paul looks at him and says, no, 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 you self-righteous Judaizers, you are the dogs. You are the evildoers, and your circumcision does nothing. He says, we're not the outsiders. He says, you are the outsiders. He says, we as Christians are the true circumcision. He says, we are the people of God, not because of external things that we've done, but because of an internal seal of the Holy Spirit. He says, we are the people of God. He completely attacks this idea that you can do anything to get your way to God. And he warns the Philippians of this self-righteousness. And so to to illustrate his point, what he does is he offers himself up as an illustration. He says, let me give you an example. Here, let me show you. If anyone could get to God by his own works, by the things that he has done, he says, it's me. I can do it. He lays out his spiritual resume, so to say. And he shows us in verses 5 and 6 all of his qualifications. And it's kind of unique here because what he shows us is four um, inherited qualifications and three achieved qualifications. So what he says is he says, man, I was circumcised on the eighth day, which according to Jewish custom and law was the exact time that you needed to be grafted into the people of God through circumcision. So he said, my parents put me in right at the right time. I was an eighth day. I didn't come in late. I was right in at the right time. I was of the people of Israel, which means I was born into the right people, God's chosen people. More than that, I was of the tribe of Benjamin, which was the tribe that the first anointed king came to Israel and was the only tribe that stayed faithful to the tribe of Judah, 
which the eventual Messiah was said to come from. He says, I was from the right tribe. I was a Hebrew of Hebrews, which most scholars say probably means that it means that both of his parents were Jewish and that he commonly spoke the language, which at this point, not all Jews did. So he said, look, my parents set me up really well. I inherited this righteousness. But more than that, I also did some things. He says, according to the law, I was a Pharisee, which the Pharisee was a sect of Judaism that was the most strict in following the law. He said, if anybody could follow the law, it was a Pharisee. He says, man, I wasn't just a Pharisee, but I had a zeal for God. He said, when Christianity began sprouting up, I persecuted and killed Christians. I fought for my God. He says, if you want to talk about the law, I'm blameless. And at that, you read that and you kind of think, that might be an exaggeration, right? Like, blameless. But notice here, he doesn't say, hey, I'm perfect. What he says is, according to the external, oh, just over 600 laws in the Old Testament, the Pharisees were said to have kept them. All external things that he says, you can't find an external law that I broke. So I'm blameless according to the law. He doesn't say I'm perfect internally. He says I'm blameless according to the external self-righteous law. Paul's saying, hey, if anybody can get to God by themselves, if anybody is righteous enough, it is me. Here's my resume. And City Light, how often do we try to do the same thing? How often do we try to stack up our good deeds in our spiritual resume as if one day we're going to face a divine interview and God wants to see that resume. Why should God let you into heaven? Well, look at the resume, right? Like, I, I grew up going to church. I grew up uh, in Awana. I memorized the right verses. I, I haven't missed a church service in 10 years. I've parent my kids really well. I look like I have it all together externally. I serve in the kids' ministry. I don't drink. I don't smoke. I, I do the right things. We compiled this list that we think one day we might have to turn into God and say, well, at least I'm better than the competition. Maybe God's going to let me in just because my resume is better than others. And I'll be honest, for the first 20 years of my life, this is how I thought it worked. I, I grew up thinking, I mean, I, I grew up going to church. Right? I was raised with good morals. I worked hard from a young age, right? Like, I, I've done some of the right things. I, I didn't drink. I didn't have sex before marriage. I, I did all the right things. I'm compiling this list and saying, look, I should be okay. And I thought, man, on that last day, I'm going to go to God and just kind of hope, here's my resume, am I in? Or we compile this and we operate in life out of a sense that God should be cool with us as long as we're pretty good, as long as we're better than somebody else, as if it's this huge competition and our resume just has to be better than some others. Have you been trying to compile a spiritual resume of your self-righteous acts? Have you tried to say, man, as long as I'm good enough, I should be okay? Because here's the reality. As we see in this text, Paul, he's going to look at us and say, look, if you can gain righteousness by the things that you've done, if you can get back to God that way, I can. He's saying, look, no one else has more than me. I mean, honestly, as you compile your resume, like, we're, we're, not, we're on different fields as Paul. Like, he's NFL, we're seventh grade JV team. Like, that's the separation. Like, we're not even playing the same game as Paul. Like, Paul is so far and above anything that we have compiled on our resume. And Paul lays it out here and says, if that's the way to do it, look at me, right? Like, I would get in. And so, if that's the way that it works... If we all just need to be self-righteous, wouldn't we expect Paul then in the next few verses to say, so be like me, right? Like do some good things, like clean yourself up now, like become blameless now, like you've got to start working harder now, you've got to be more like me, let me be your example. Well, let's see what he says. Verse 7, he starts, but... This is a hinge. Spoiler alert, he's not going to say that, okay? But 
Whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things. Count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ, be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. You see, right in verse 7, Paul completely changes his tune. He lays out his resume for us, shows that if righteousness can be gained through us, says, I could do it. But then in verse 7 he says, but whatever gain I had, whatever self-righteousness I acquired, however good my resume looks, all the, the religious deeds that I've done, all the fame and reputation that I've acquired, all the praise that I've gotten, he says, I counted it as loss for the sake of Christ. What we see is Paul switching from protecting us from a self-righteous view to now he's going to show us the right way to believe. He's switching here. He's pleading with us for a different type of righteousness. He says, everything that I've gained so far, that whole resume, it's a loss. It's rubbish. It's garbage. It's disgusting to me. I count that of no value for the sake of Christ. And City Light, I mean, honestly, how can this be? How can he say every good thing I've done is garbage? It's disgusting. I, I hate that. I don't look at that at all. That's garbage to me for the sake of Christ. How, how can he say this? Well, I think it comes in verse 9. Paul says in verse 9, this idea that on that last day, when he does face God, when he's got to come face to face with God and be judged, he says, I want to be found in Christ. So what he's saying here is, hey, I don't want to be found in my deeds. I don't want to hand him my resume. I don't want to be looked at by the holy, perfect, righteous God. I don't want him to look at me. He says, I want to be found in Christ. How? He says, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law. That's self-righteousness. But that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith. So there's two things that I want us to notice about this verse. First, this idea is imputed righteousness. Imputed righteousness. Now, what that means simply is that it does not come from inside of you. It's not deep down in your soul and God just needs to kind of bring that out. It is a righteousness that you could not and did not earn or merit. It came from outside and was imputed or gifted to you. And Paul says, I only got this righteousness, the righteousness that I really needed, from Christ. And you see in here, uh, maybe a more accurate translation of this verse would say, not simply a faith in Christ, but the faithfulness of of Christ, the faith of Christ. Well, what does this mean? You see, we often, when we preach the, the Bible and preach the gospel, we like to talk about how Jesus died for us, how Jesus' cross is good news for us. But City Light, if Christ forgave you of your sins, you still would need a righteousness. Right, so if you can be forgiven of everything, but you still need a righteousness. Pastor Chris told me this week, he said, man, it's not just going from a negative 10 to a zero, which is forgiveness. He said, you got to go from a negative 10 to a perfect 10. Like, you still don't get in as neutral. You've got to be perfectly righteous. So the gospel message isn't just that Christ died to forgive you. It's that before he died, he lived a perfect life. His entire life, he earned the perfect, righteous life requirement that is needed to be with God. And this is beautifully summarized in 2 Corinthians 5.21. Paul writes this. He said, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin. So this is what he's saying. 
says God sent Jesus, and even though Jesus was absolutely perfect, never sinned, fully righteous, he did not deserve the punishment of the unrighteous, which is death, said he treated him, regarded him as sinful so that he would die on the cross. Why? Why? So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. See, the gospel message isn't just that you've been forgiven. It's that you need to be gifted, imputed righteousness. And this verse says that on that last day, man, we, don't, we don't need to be found in our self-righteousness. We need to become Christ's righteousness. The righteousness of God needs to be, we need to be seen in this righteousness. We need it. It is the only way. So how do we gain it? How do we get this righteousness? How are, we, how are we found in him on that final day? Second part of verse 9 says that it is from God that depends on faith. So City Light, hear me. The way you become righteous enough to be with God is solely through faith that Jesus came to earth that he was faithful and fulfilled the righteous requirement needed to be with God, yet Jesus died on the cross to forgive you of your sins and gift you the righteous requirement of salvation. That's it. Let me, let me say that one more time. So listen, the way you become righteous enough to be with God, the only way this works is solely through faith that Jesus came to earth, that he was faithful and fulfilled the righteous requirement needed to be with God, yet he died on the cross to forgive you of your sins and gift you the righteous requirement of salvation. That is the gospel message. That is the only way. It is Paul's plea for the church. He says, don't be caught on that last day being found in yourself. Don't try to hand God your spiritual resume saying you do not want this. This is not going to go well, but he pleads with us. On that day, would you be clothed and cloaked in the righteousness of Christ? That when God sees you, he doesn't see your sin. He sees the righteousness of Christ. It's his plea for us. So, friends, this morning... I want each and every one of us to wrestle with this question. I want you to ask yourself right now this question. If I am a sinner, how do I become right with a holy, perfect, and righteous God whom I've sinned against? If I'm not perfect, if I have sinned, if I've screwed up, how do I become right with God? In other words, on that last day, when God asked, man, why? Why should you get into heaven? Why should you be with God? What is your answer? How do you respond? Let me give you two options that Paul gives us from this text. First, you can attempt to get right with God by your own spiritual resume of self-righteousness. You can continue coming to church because you think that's what Christians do. You can continue to not swear and not drink and and dress nice and look the part. You can continue treating people nice and, and trying to just generally kind of love people because God is love and we'll all kind of get swept up in the end to heaven You can continue to to do good things and give the homeless guy a dollar and and do all the right things. You can continue to compile your spiritual resume. You can. But hear me. And more importantly, hear this book when it says it is not good enough. All of your self-righteous acts will not be good enough. It's not going to work. And I mean, think about it just logically. If you've sinned in the past, if you can say, I'm not perfect, you don't need to just try harder. You need that sin forgiven, right? If you've, if you've been declared guilty against God, you don't need to just get better now. You need to be declared innocent of that. And if, as the Bible says, we are spiritually dead because of our sin, church, no amount of good works can a dead soul do to bring himself to life. It doesn't work. You cannot get to God 
by yourself. So maybe, just maybe, there's another way. Maybe we need something else. Maybe we need not a self-righteousness, but an imputed or gifted righteousness. Maybe we need forgiveness, innocence, and life given to us. Maybe we need a righteousness that isn't dependent on ourselves, but is dependent on Christ's faithfulness and gifted by God through faith. Friends, do you believe this? As you stand before a holy and perfect God, what's your answer? Why should you be right with God? Why should you get in to heaven? Why should you experience eternal life? And I'm telling you this morning, if your answer is anything apart from simply Jesus, it's not enough. Whether it's more or whether it's less, it is not enough. It's all we have. We have nothing else. Hallelujah. All we have is Christ. That's it. That's, that is our answer. We don't come to God with our resume. We rip that up. We count it as loss, and we stand clothed in Christ's righteousness. That's it. That is our only hope. So where is your faith put? Where are you trusting on that last day? Are you going to say, man, I'm going to trust and put my faith in myself? Or will you say, man, I'm going to put my faith in Christ. There's an old hymn written in the late 1800s by Eliza Hewitt. And the first verse and chorus, I think, just summarizes this so well. It reads like this. She wrote, My faith has found a resting place. And not in device or creed. I trust the ever-living one. His wounds for me shall plead. I have no other argument. I have no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. City Light, this must be our heart's cry. There is nothing else, no amount of works, no other argument, nothing on that day that will get you right with God if you are found in yourself. So please, today, if you have been trusting in yourself, if you have thought, I just need to be better, I just need to be good enough, heed Paul's warning. Saying, if anyone could, I could. And he says, it wasn't enough. We're not even in the same comparison as Paul, and he says, it's not going to work. Would you today rip up that resume and trust Christ? Or maybe for some of you in the room, you look at Paul and you say, I know I'm nothing like Paul. Like, I barely stumbled into church this morning. I, man, I feel weak. I feel guilt and shame and sin weighing me down. I don't think I even have a shot to get to God. This righteousness is for you, too. This righteousness, this God-given righteousness is for you in this exact same way through faith. Would you trust that today? And Christian, if you're in the room, Christians, would you, as Paul, count everything else as a loss compared to knowing Christ? Paul says, I want to live for Christ. I want to suffer for Christ. I will die for Christ. Whatever it is that gets me closer to Christ, I will do because he is worth it. Is he supremely valuable to you? Is your life marked by passionately following Christ? We don't read our Bibles and come to church and do good things to get Christ, but once you've experienced him, you can do nothing else but chase after him with your life. And finally, church as a whole. This idea of self-righteous salvation can have no place among us. Paul vehemently fought against this idea, and we too must vehemently fight against this. In our minds, in our hearts, in our pulpit, we cannot begin to believe that we have a part in our salvation it is anti-gospel. It does not save. What saves is faith in Christ. So today, this morning, 
to conclude, I want all of us, anyone in the room who has just given up on self-righteousness, who has ripped up their resume, even if today is the very first day for you, even if you walked in the room not believing and you now trust and believe in Christ, what I want us to do is there's a room full of of Christ-centered sinners that trust in his blood-bought salvation, would we together say the, the chorus of this hymn? I told the 9 o'clock I'd have us sing it, but I have a terrible voice, so we're not doing that. We're going to say it, and it's going to be just as holy, all right? So what I want us to do, if you believe this, would you say this with me? And if today is the first day, would you say this and then after I pray during the songs, there's going to be a prayer team in the back. If today is the day that you want to place your faith in Christ, have these words be true of you, would you please go back, tell somebody, pray with somebody. We want to celebrate that Christ saves. So as a church, anyone who believes this, will you say this with me? I have no other argument. I have no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. Father God, thank you. Thank you for being so good and gracious and loving to your people. Jesus, I beg you now, would you save us from our self-righteousness? Would you kill this desire in us that wants to compete, wants to compare and wants to get better just so that we can get closer to you. God, would you kill that in us? Would we rest in what you've done? And would all that we do be out of an identity that already says found in Christ? Would you gift righteousness to souls in this room right now? Would your spirit lift veils? Would you shed light? And would people rejoice this morning in salvation in you? Would we give up? trying? Would we find freedom in you? Father God, it is all for your glory, and we pray through your wonderful, beautiful Son's name. Amen.